And so the third thing that we can say positively about the Lord is, you know, we're trying to go through this whole section here of, you know, who is God? We've said some negative things and um, that he's not. And sometimes we use those things and we talk about God and we don't really think about what we're doing. Um, but as we had said, he is uh, absolute, he is tripersonal, and he is transcendent, and he is imminent. These are some larger words, and I get it, so I need to define them a little bit. Um, transcendence refers to God's majesty. Um, the largeness of God, the greatness of God, the, the transcendence of God. You know, we talk uh, oftentimes in sports that <clears throat> there are certain players that are transcendent players. In other words, they, they sort of, every generation talks about them. Um, and then there's players that are not transcendent. You know, oftentimes uh, I'm a basketball fan and oftentimes uh, at, a, at an NBA draft, they'll say nobody in this uh, draft probably will be a transcendent player. And so God is transcendent um, because he is God. Um, eminence refers to his nearness. And this is, this is one of the things about God as we talk about God that makes it difficult to understand <clears throat> and talk about God, which is why there's never been a consensus doctrine of God in the uh, um, in the church, because it's 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 hard to talk about God. If you remember earlier in this class, I said one of the things when we do theology that's tough is to talk about God because he he's not like us, um, but yet he is knowable. And so when we talk about God being transcendent and imminent, th there seems to be a, um, a a little bit of a complexity to that because we, we think of God being you know large and big, and we sort of <clears throat> understand that, but that God is also near, that he's close, that he's imminent. Um, those are those are things that unfortunately, <clears throat> oftentimes people will go <clears throat> to one extreme or the other with this um, understanding of God, that you know, he's, he's transcendent, get that, he's big, he's large, he's majestic, that sounds like God. But then he's near, is he really? I mean, is he close and relational, you know, all those things. And but both of these are true at the same time. God's transcendence deals with his kingship. God's transcendence deals with his sovereignty over things, that he is a sovereign God. Um, and and when, we, when we say that he is a sovereign God, um, I just, I, sometimes I abbreviate things and I know what I'm saying, but um, let me change that a little bit. So, um, his transcendence is his majesty, his kingship, his sovereignty. We can even add a ty here if we want. Um, his sovereignty, his uh, his he's just he just he's just God with with a large G. Um, Karl Barth, um, great um, theologian, and um, if you're not familiar with Karl Barth, um, it looks like Karl Barth, but it's Karl Barth. Um, Karl Barth was uh. Um, a, a famous um, theologian that uh, um, wrote a, 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 a commentary on Romans called Der Romerbrief um, in German and uh, was a, a, a fairly significant piece at the time because scholarship had gone um, fairly liberal. Um, and, and Karl Barth, although I don't know that most people would consider him to be <clears throat> massively conservative, um, definitely hit more of a conservative note in his commentary and it really was a an adjustment to theolo theology I mean, he's a he's a he's a giant um in in the study of theology Karl Barth um coined a phrase about God's transcendence his majesty his kingship his sovereignty and I, I love this he said that God is holy holy other um that's just a great phrase that he's wholly other that he's transcendent he's mat majestic he's king he's sovereign he's wholly other um those are those are some ways to think about god this is who who god is um i, I think that 
If you were to uh, look at Psalm 113, turn, turn there with me, if you will. Psalm 113. We'll go there and we're going to read verses 4 and 5. Let me write this down here. Psalm 113, 4 and 5. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? You know, you you see here the largeness of God, this holy other, this, uh, um, um, the idea here that uh, um, the transcendence of God. Let me clear this off now. There's a lot of stuff on here and probably hard to read at this point. Um, But we see the the transcendence of God. There's a a great definition, um, and uh, I, I think this is probably one of the, better ways to say it, that transcendence pertains to the degree which God surpasses our finite human abilities to conceive and describe. Let me read that again. Transcendence pertains to the degree which God surpasses our finite human abilities to conceive and describe. In other words, God's holy other. There there is a sense that God is simply beyond you and me. That sense is his transcendence. And, And that is a part when we say, who is God? He is transcendent. He is beyond you and me. He is sovereign. He is majestic. He is king. Um, But if God were only transcendent, and this is is where the part of eminence um, comes in, that he's eminent, that he is near. If God was only transcendent, then we would have a problem. He would be unknowable. We wouldn't be able to know him. Because he's God. And there's a sense that we need to have that healthy respect for God when we talk about God, that he is beyond you and me. And um, I always say that whenever somebody feels like they have a firm grasp on God, whatever that firm grasp is, you have an idol in your hand because God is in some ways beyond our understanding. The parts that we can know about God, he has told us, but there are the infinitude of God means that there are parts about God that we don't know, that an eternal life, uh, you know, Jesus said in John 17, three, that eternal life is that they may know you, the only true true God. And that word know in, in the original language is to continually know that for eternity, we will continue to know more and more about this God that is so transcendent and beyond us. Um, and that's That's part of who God is. When we say, who is God? He's transcendent. But if he was transcendent only, he would not be knowable by you and me. And so he is also imminent. And the idea um, that transcendence deals with God's sovereignty and otherness, imminence deals with his everywhere and nearness. That God is everywhere and he is near these become super important things as we as we as we think about god and as we talk about god that he's not just this transcendent god that is beyond but he's also everywhere and near and that's that's a that's an important biblical teaching in acts uh, 17 28 if you want to flip there with me Acts 17, 28, flip there with me, your Bible. And Acts 17, 28 tells us about God's nearness, about his imminence. It says in Acts 17, 28, it says, In him we live and move and we have our being. In other words, there's a sense that God is also everywhere. 
there's a sense that God is also near, and and, and he is. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the omnis, uh, that's the Latin for all. You know, he's omniscient, he's all-knowing, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere present. Um, you know, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. Um, but the fact of God's omniscience, um, that he knows everything, um, the fact that he's also omnipresent, he is everywhere. This is the sense of Acts 17, 28, and it's the sense of eminence. You might re be reminded of in the Psalms where David says, if I <clears throat> go to the highest of the heavens, you are there. And if I go down to Sheol or I go to Hades, you are there as well. There's a sense that God is everywhere and near. And these concepts are important because what they do is even though they can be confusing, that God's holy other, but he's also near, they're who God is. And, and, and that's why it becomes uh, difficult. When we talk about who is God, we, we have to sort of have the right thinking about who he is, or what we'll do is we'll start to refer to him in ways that um, are not true, or, or they're a sliver of the truth. And that's the, that's the most difficult thing as we do theology together, is, is to try to realize that um, we want to keep the whole together and not part out certain things. I mean, I think most Christians love the idea that God is near. He's, he's a near God. He's relational. He loves me. Um, but then the sovereignty part and the holy other part tends to be something that we go, well, I, you know, I don't know. And um, that also keeps us, in, in my opinion, from bad doctrine is when the two are um, kept together. So he's both transcendent and imminent. Now we have another thing about God. God is unchanging. Let's see here. Oh, come on. Give me a, let me just clear these strokes. Here we go. So he is unchanging, but he's also changing, which this is like, what? How, how can you be both? This is the beauty of talking about God. There's scriptural themes in scripture that says God is an unchanging God. Um, and, and we believe that. We, we believe that God's not like man. He doesn't change his mind, um, that God is um, God within himself. And there's there's no need for improvement um, or deterioration. He's just God. And so that in that sense, he is unchanging. Um, that's just who he is. Um, but there's the sense that he also changes because um, if he didn't, how would God have become man. That, 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 that is a change. It's not a change in essence, but it is a change in form. And, and I think that um, this is really important. So when we say that God is changeless, um, a lot of that um, is, uh, is, is stuff that's imported from Greek philosophy. Um, and you know, I, I think that there, there is a sense in which God is unchanging, that he is, he is God. But there's also a, a sense that God um, is um, responding. Um, I, I, I refer to God is that he's, he's not just static, although there are parts of God that his character seems to be that way. But God is also dynamic. He does respond. He does enter in to relationships with you and me. And, and this, is, uh, um, this is confusing um, because we, we want to always sort of go to one or the other and doing that what it does is it creates issues um, about God because if he's just this static deity um, and there's no nothing um, is is other than the script well then you, you run into problems of like you know is there is there just like is everything fate um, you know it fated or you know is, is there are we robots or you know all that stuff and then the, the changing part, um, can can lead God to look like he's like a short order cook that he's constantly sort of like you know f trying to figure out what's going on. Those are not true, but that that the the tension of the unchanging and changing parts of God um, are are important. You know, so as we continue to delve into this, um, you know, we're, we're we're seeing wow, you know, there's this is a this is a tough subject. I mean, you know, we just <laughs> it's easy to go to church and just sing about God, and not really think about these things. But when you start really thinking about God, it's, you realize, wow, this is this is pretty big. So let's continue on because we we want to we want to continue to try to what I'm trying to do is take this funnel of of a lot of things and 
and help us to better understand who God is. We've talked about, you know, some things that he's not, some language that we use, some things that we can start to say, okay, here, let's start to shape, shape God. Um, but one of the next things that we, that we struggle with when it comes to, to, uh, to God is language. And this is, uh, something that not everybody wants to talk about this idea of language. Um, one of the major issues that we have, and we said, we briefly talked about it earlier is that it's tough to talk about God. Um, how does a language that is mostly bound to space and time and bound to our world, how does that adequately then start to reflect who God is? Well, it's difficult. And, and, and I think this is important that we get um, in, in this class is that, that we understand that God really is large, that you know, oftentimes it's so easy for us to want to put God in a box. And I'm sure you've met people, I, I was that way when I was younger. Um, I had God fully understood. I had every passage of the scripture understood until I started really wrestling with the fact that God is also transcendent. He's not just imminent. Um, wrestling with the fact that, yes, he is unchanging, but he's also changing and, and, and how those things work together. They're, they're, they're tough. They're, they're difficult subjects to, to put together. It's much like, you know, scripture. We say it's the word of God, but it was written by people. Jesus is fully God. He's also fully man. There, there are some... Um, paradoxes to our faith and language becomes difficult because it's we struggle in the way we talk about God well at least there should be the, the the sense of struggle that hey we're 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 trying to talk about some things that maybe we we don't know I love what my uh, um, professor Don battle said um, in in the systematic theology class he said God, is the subject of our theological inquiry. But he is never the object of our theological inquiry. What does that mean? What that means is, is we can talk about God as a subject, but we never talk about God as an object because we can't, we can't wrap our arms around who, who God is. Um, so it's difficult. In, in the early church, um, there were there were there, there were this understanding that that certain things about God were being said that that maybe um, pushed the barriers of um, language. Um, you know, so when we when we talk about God, when we talk about speaking about Him, there, there needs to be a little bit of um, humility. To realize that we we are never going to be able to exhaust God, that that that, that God is beyond you and me, and, and the things that we know about God, we know. Um, I often think of uh, um, um, Deuteronomy um, twenty nine twenty nine says that the things that belong to you and me, that, that God has revealed, belong to you and me, but the secret things belong to the Lord. There's just stuff about God that we simply don't know. And so now that we have started to um, scrape the surface, and you probably at this point are going, "Wow, this is a this is a big endeavor. This is a, um, I mean, Chip, this is there's a lot of complexity here. Like, I mean, you know, I never really thought about God this way. Maybe it was sort of easier when I just came to church and left and went home and watched the ball game. And you know, and I, I get that. I mean, I, I understand that um, sometimes that's great, but when we when we start to really talk about God, we realize, wow, this is a, this is a big subject. This is complex. And so what we're going to have to do is, um, as we start to brush out who is God, we, we will have to now turn to talking about language because we do have um, things, which we call revelation, about God. And we're going to have to take, you know, the idea that, hey, we know that God is tripersonal. We, we know that God is absolute. We know that he's transcendent and imminent. We know that changing and unchanging. We know these things about God. We know that language is difficult to talk about God. What we're going to do is we're going to continue that funnel as we now go and talk a little bit about how language talks about God and what scripture says more about God. What, what, what that'll do is that will continue to broaden our understanding of who is God, but it will also continue to show us that um, we are really just scratching at a surface um, when, we, when we do this endeavor and that theology is um, 
can be great and it can be fun, but it is very challenging and uh, um, you know can 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 definitely lead us into a place where we go, wow, this is this is beyond me. And in many ways, I hope that I can thread that needle of wanting to keep you engaged in learning about God, but also to to keep some of that amazement that. Um, we should always have as a, as a theologian that God is really holy other than he is God. So we'll turn to uh, um, this idea of uh, language and revelation next. Hey, Chip here. I just want to take a moment and say thanks so much for, for watching Reaching the Next Generation. Um, I really hope that this was something that was beneficial to you. And what I would ask, if you really enjoyed this, would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? Would you give us some comments? And most importantly, would you share it? Um, I believe with all of my heart that the material and the content that we have on this channel truly can make a difference and resource pastors and leaders and Christians, and you can help us to truly help others to reach the next generation. Thanks so much for being a part of our channel.